So good afternoon. My name is Jean-Michel Blanquer. I'm the Director General for Schools in the French Ministry of uh, National Education. And I'm um, very happy and very honored to have the responsibility to give the floor to a very uh, interesting in invitees in this, uh, uh, in this um, table about um, preventing dropout. Um, we all think that dropout is one of the main problems of the school systems all over the world. It's maybe a revelator of the failures of our systems. Uh, but dropout means a lot of things. We have a lot of roots for dropout, a lot of causes. Uh, in particular, you have social uh, reasons, but sometimes uh, those factors are linked to the problems of our educational systems. Um, again, dropout is also um, a, a revelator of problems before school, problems in school and problems after school. We are going to speak about that with persons from all over the world, someone from Canada, someone from Cuba, and someone from Africa, Guinea exactly, but who works on all Africa. In a, a, a minute I'm going to present them, three women. Um, but first I have to tell you some things about the organization of this session. Um, first, there will, be, there will be a debate among uh, those panelists and uh, it will uh, last about 40 minutes. And then we will have the possibility to uh, have a, a discussion uh, with you, the participants in the room, and also um, this, uh, this year, uh, thanks to my wise and Twitter, uh, we are going to, some, to have some uh, questions on screen. Uh, I, I think that you can see that right now. Uh, you have to ensure that your headset works are correctly uh, put. Please do not place any items in front of the remote. And uh, you have the translation channels uh, on screen normally. So uh, now I, uh, um, I'm, we are going to speak all together. And um, so I, I call Aisha Ba Diallo. She's a former Minister for Education in Guinea, but she's right now the uh, responsible of the Chair Forum of African Women Educationalists, FAO, and uh, uh, one of the responsibles of the Réseau pour l'Education pour Tous en Afrique, uh, named RETA. Uh, she's involved in education for all and in lifelong learning uh, education, specifically for girls and, and women. I call also uh, Caroline Acker. At the beginning of her, of her career, she was a nurse, or she is a nurse, uh, but she, uh, she, uh, she is going to explain uh, that she found pathways to education which is uh, at the center of our problematic today. Uh, she represents a non-governmental organization concerned about high school dropout uh, in impoverished communities. And I call right now Mercedes Zamora Collazo. She's um, from Cuba. She's an academic uh, advisor for, of the Literacy and Education Chair for Young and Adults in the IPLAC, which is the Latin American and Caribbean Pedagogical Institute. And uh, she's uh, responsible of Yo Si Puedo, uh, which is a Cuban program of literacy uh, used in, not only in Cuba, but in many countries in, in the region and in uh, some parts of the world. She's going to speak about that, of course. So we can begin the, our discussion. And uh, I think that we have to first discuss about a definition of dropout, because dropout is, uh, has a lot of uh, uh, features, a lot of uh, 
manifestations. Um, we have dropouts at any age. We have dropouts drop out in, in very different contexts. So it's interesting to see the definition of dropout and also uh, to see what we do to prevent dropout and what we do when there is dropout to uh, get back uh, the, the children or the young persons in the, in the school system or in the social integration in special structures. So maybe we could have a, a first discussion about the definition of dropout uh, because I, I think it's an important uh, point and maybe see, Aisha you could begin by the, your definition of, of dropout. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Dropout is due to many factors. These factors are multiple. They interlink. It is, it is a process rather than one single event. For instance, in Africa, because I'm going to focus myself on sub-Saharan Africa, dropout is due to social factors, social cultural factors, and it is also due to the education system itself. If I look into the facts and figures for sub-Saharan Africa, every single year, 10 million kids drop out. 9% 9 million, 9 drop out uh, before finishing the first year. The repetition rate is 13%. It is as simple as that. Now, if you want to tell me to tell you right now what to do to, to bring, I mean, to, to, to um, prevent dropout, I will tell you that we have to work on these two factors. The community factor, which is social cultural. That depends on poverty and patriarchal attitudes. Poverty, because when the parents are very poor, they cannot sustain the education of their children. Therefore, there is a possibility to give bursaries to the kids. This is what Farway has done, and it, it is in uh, 37 countries. We have given bursaries to, starting 2003 up to 2007, 146,000 kids, 30% were boys, had these bursaries. It has helped them to come to school. And as far as patriarchal uh, attitudes is con are concerned, we had to do some advocacy at the community level to prevent parents from marrying their girls early. Because they used to marry them before they are 18, which is in fact against the law. And also to bring the g girls to school we li did link up with other NGOs. These other NGOs would give grants to the parents so that they will uh, develop other projects to have money. We were working also with the uh, PTAs, you know, parent, teachers, uh, associations, involving them in, uh, in the management of the school. This is for the social cultural factors. As far as the education sector is concerned, it is important to have schools, adequate schools, enough schools near the home so that parents will send the kids, especially girls, because if it is very far, the girls will not come. And these schools have to be secure. They have to be safe. You have to have water and sanitation. You have to have infirmary. And in this infirmary, it is important to have malaria, anti-malaria pills, deworming pills, and also sanitary pad, emergency sanitary pads for the girls. And it is important to have them at least one meal a day. It makes a difference. So that you will solve the question of hunger and health. And as far as teachers is concerned, we all said, since yesterday we have been hearing that teachers are the key. What FAWE has done is to give them uh, in-service teacher training, which is called uh, 
to be for them to be gender responsive because the teachers have to cater for boys and girls so that the dynamic within the classroom will allow girls and boys to participate it will retain girls especially and also um, now learning materials and curriculum they have to be developed using the context of the learner because if it doesn't if it doesn't talk to the learner it will not answer, interest the, the, the kids if you talk for instance in africa you talk about counting apples in the, instead of oranges or mangoes it doesn't talk to them well you also have a lot of gender violence at school to prevent it what fawe has done is to empower the kids through what we call to same it's a program where boys and girls come together see themselves the, the, the questions the problems they have find themselves a solution write a, a drama out of it play and it, it has helped a lot now the teachers and the boys are respecting the girls so learning to live together this is what what uh, fawe has done through to same and it has helped a lot and you have another also way of uh, making sure that uh, the school will be safe and secure is to have a fence you know in africa it's not that easy but it, it has helped a lot i think i'll stop there i'll come back later thank you thank you very much it's already very rich because we see uh, different factors of dropout and first the material reasons and then the what we can call the intellectual or mental reasons uh, which can be some of them can be different and some of some of, some of them can be the same as uh, what we can find in europe or in, in north america so maybe karin you can tell us about your experience and uh, your definition of dropout and and your perception of the factors of dropout okay thank you very much um as was mentioned i'm uh, my background is is uh, nursing so i came at this problem from the healthcare perspective i didn't know we had a dropout problem i was running the re somebody's phone is ringing i was running the region park community health center and we were providing primary care early years very large early years programs community garden community development housing work safety work in the largest and oldest social housing project in Canada. Very, very low income community, extremely poor. Now, we were increasing the resources of the health center. The, the organization in the 90s grew from, say, 2.2 2 .2 million to about 6 million over five years, from 28 staff to 68 staff. But what was going on was an increase in violence in the community. There was one murder, then two murders, then three murders. The year before we developed this program, in the year 2000, there were nine murders right in that community. The kids were selling drugs, involved with gangs, and I was going crazy. I felt all we were was a Band-Aid, and it wasn't logical that we kept investing more resources in this community, and instead of it getting better, it was getting worse. So that's when we started to look further, and it was a vision. We developed a vision called Community Succession, and this vision meant that the young people growing up in this community would become the future doctors, nurses, social worker, executive director, dentist, etc., of the health center. And it was that vision and using action research, we did focus groups with the community, with the parents, with the students, with the teachers. We gathered all kinds of data and we did something that had never been done before. We asked the school board, what is the dropout rate for the kids living in our community? In Canada, you get an average. The average doesn't tell you anything because as soon as you overlay income on that, you see the 
the difference. We had a 56% high school dropout rate. And we learned that only 20% of the kids were going on to post-secondary education. When I learned we had a 56% dropout rate, I understood the despair, the hopelessness, the teen pregnancy, the violence, and we had to do something about that. And I was driven by a sense of social justice to correct this problem, and it wasn't easy. But using action research, we learned that, and this is true, so far we have replicated this program in 11 different communities, and all of these low-income kids have the same experience. They lack academic support, they lack social support. They don't have money to buy a bus ticket to get to school, never mind to buy lunch at school or even clothes to wear. And they have no hope that they can go on to post-secondary education. So that's what we had to turn around. They lived within a culture of failure. So we needed to turn that around somehow. And um, I think I'll stop there for now. Thank you very much. We will come back to those uh, factors to see w what are the solutions or the, the pathway to, the, the to solution. Um, so now I give the floor to Mercedes Zamora. Uh, if you want to tell us your definition of dropout and the causes of dropout when there is dropout. Well, we don't have uh, this problem in Cuba. But um, according with my experience in different countries that we have worked, there is, uh, from my point of view, when we talk about dropout, the people think in the student and the teachers. But it's not exactly only these factors, the one that can prevent dropout. Because I think that dropout is the the reason of lack or enough attention to, to different factors. But when we have dropout, it's because the system of influences that should act in the students fail. And it means for me, not only teacher's role, but the role of the community, the family, mainly the parents' responsibility. And education is a factor that can contribute to eliminate this. That's why for us, it's important adult education. If we have illiterate parents, what can they do with their children? Which is the concept that they have of the importance of education. And there are many factors in the case of dropout. One case is there are geography results in some cases because the school is so far from the student that they drop out. In other cases, social uh, reasons because there are students that do not have solved their basic needs. And in other cases, the cultural reasons, because they receive in the school something that is not much with them, culture. And they don't feel that is their school. They not identify that what they learn in the school is what they need. And that is another problem that we have. And financial aspect, because in some cases, like, like my colleague uh, explained, they don't have possibility to go to school because they need to work to survive. That's why we devote a lot of time for adult education because that is one of the points that can contribute to prevent dropout. In the case of my country, since the, uh, since the moment that we finished the literacy campaign, people, that were at that time illiterate, 
and become literate with the campaign, some year later, they get a professional status. And of course, it helped in the conscience of the people the importance of study. And they send the student to school because they know that it's the only way that the student can improve the way of life. Thank you very much. So in your interventions, your three interventions, we see uh, some different categories of factors. Um, you have mentioned the material factors, the lack of uh, means, the lack of uh, tickets of bus or things like that, the lack of, uh, of uh, food and this kind of thing. Um, one of the questions around that is the conditioning of that because you have um, spoken uh, also of about um, uh, responsabilization, uh, implication of the, of, the, of the family. So we could have a first exchange about this point, which is what are the solution in the, in the field of material means? And what do you think about the responsabilization that we can, uh, which can accompany these uh, uh, material uh, measures? We can begin with you if you want, Caroline. Um, so I'm speaking from the developed world, right? Wealthy world with very, very good public education system. I love the public education system in Canada. It's outstanding. But what we know now is that socioeconomic status is the biggest predictor of whether or not you're going to make it. When we put income on top of the data of the dropouts, we learned that middle income and up, the dropout rate is 6 to 11%. But for the lowest income kids, it's 50 and 60%, and we are in North Winnipeg, where we have a large Aboriginal population, and the dropout rate there is 78%. Now, this is appalling, but this is true across Canada and the United States, all right? So what we did was we worked with the parents, and we, uh, where we developed this in Regent Park was an extremely multicultural community people from Bangladesh, people from Sri Lanka, people from Vietnam, people from China, very, very diverse. So uh, we spoke to the people in their own languages. And the parents told us, when we showed them the vision, which they said education is key, employment is key, they wanted their children to graduate high school so that they could go to post-secondary so they could get a job, and they told us that they wanted a job also. So then when we took the lens down even further and spoke to the people, the kids themselves, this is when we learned the lack of academic support. How can someone who's never been, doesn't speak the language, help, help their child with homework? It's impossible. All right. So, but you ask about responsibility. Our program came from the bottom. The parents and the children identified this. They sign a contract to come into the program to give us permission to collect data because the program is results driven. We need to monitor credit accumulation and absenteeism. Those are our leading indicators. Our lagging indicators are the dropout rate, uh, the graduation rate, and post-secondary participation. They sign a contract, they come to tutoring. We offer tutoring four nights a week, but the students have to come for tutoring. We hand out bus tickets to the students every two weeks or a lunch voucher, but they only get that if they attend school. So accountability is built in. They come for mentoring, and the mentoring we came up with for this group was in the early years of high school, grades nine and 10, we do group mentoring so that they build social skills, negotiation, uh, team building, collaboration, 
build a support network. When they get into grade 11 and 12, we work with them on what's their passion. Where do they see themselves working? What careers would they like to know about? Would they like to know about the trades? Would they like to, are they interested in healthcare? And, or, 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 and then we work with corporations, you see? We partnered, we did this, not with government money, because you cannot innovate with government dollars, because you can make huge mistakes. So with a solid partnership with the school, we created this program and uh, measured our data. And the kids actually told us in our first year, when we asked them, we did our focus groups and we asked the, the students, why don't you come to tutoring? And you know, the, the boys said, if you want us there, you have to make it mandatory. So we said, it's mandatory. You see, they want, they want boundaries, they want limits. So we surround these students with this support from 5.30 on in partnership with the school. And there's, I need to explain one key role. There is a key role and that's the student parent support worker. This is a paid position and each student parent support worker oversees 50 students, 5 And they monitor their t attendance, credit accumulation, hand out the bus tickets, and form a solid relationship and hold the students accountable. And one of the students said to me, they're like a coach and a referee. They support them, encourage them. They might also say, perhaps you should take a look at that. If you do that, have you thought about the consequences? But in the end, it's up to the student. The scholarship, I was ra raised $1,000 per student per year, up to $4,000 for a hand up to post-secondary. And five years after we started this program, the dropout rate went from 56% to 11%, and post-secondary attendance went from 20% to 83%. And we have now, as I said, replicated it in 11 there are 11 programs across the country, and there are 4,300 students getting these supports right now, producing similar results. And each community that has this program, you have to make the program tailored to the community. The context, as Aisha said, is extremely important. In the North Winnipeg program, the students do have dinner. We feed them. And when I saw this the first time, and I asked, I see you're giving the, they told me, yes, in some cases, it's the first or only meal of the day. So you make the program unique to the student, but the student must be responsible. They have to work hard or they won't pass. So they learn discipline, setting goals, work now, play later. But what they respond to is being surrounded by caring and support. Thank you very much. We, we understand, uh, among a lot of things, that from the material problems, we go to the psychological problems you know, through responsibility, accountability, and uh, I think it's one of the lessons of uh, your experience. Uh, maybe, Aisha, you could give us a, an African focus about uh, those process. First of all, um, the education system, especially basic education, it is the responsibility of governments. So the, it is up to any minister, because I used to be a minister, I'm still working with ministers. They have to have a vision. They have to, have, they have to believe in their mission, transform it into a policy. That policy has to be prepared with the involvement of of all stakeholders, then they have to be able to mobilize funds. And we all know that the funds, more than 90% come from within the country. And then the rest is coming from outside, multi and bilaterals. But if you do not have a good product, who's going to buy it? Nobody. Therefore, you have to have a very good policy, good program, projects, actions, activities. And uh, now, because we have to talk about how to bring back the kids that have 
dropped out. I will focus on girls. So for the early, for the kids that have been married before the age, we have to do a lot of advocacy at community level. What I did when I was a minister, because we did the, an action research and found out that the factors that are really putting girls outside of the education system, it's that early marriage and uh, pregnancy. So what we did in my department was to track the girls starting fifth year. So every year, at, at, at the end of the year, fifth year, all the structures from up to down, we will track the girls in the classrooms and, 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 and take their names. And at the beginning of the sixth year, we come again, we count them. If they are not present, we invite the parents to come. And I personally tell them, give me back my daughter because the girl is mine, you have put her in school, now she is ours, and it, it works. In 1991, we were able to save 35 of them. They came back, and some of them are doctors today, pharmacy and whatever. As for pregnancy, what, I, what we did in my department was to lobby for two years. I myself had to use radio, radio rural, you know, when we use the local languages so that the communities will understand. The national radio, the television, for two years to lobby the parents and the teachers. They did not want it. They said, well, if you bring them back, you are going to, you know, uh, encourage other girls to get pregnant. I said, well, come on. Parents, did you tell these girls their sexual maturation? No. Did we do it at school? No. So we have to share this responsibility. It is a core responsibility we have to assume. Therefore, they have to come back to school. Then they start the nodding, you know. When I saw the, the heads nodding, I said, Haha, it's time to take a decision. I took the decision. They are going to be back to school. And in three years' time, we were able to save 125 girls, which is a lot. And Fawe, in 1994, used this experience to convey all minist male ministers to come to a meeting and discuss this experience. Therefore, as of today, all African countries have this policy, bringing back pregnant adolescents so that they will be able to continue their studies. There is another way of bringing back dropout to school using the non-formal approach. In special centers, we call them NAFA. NAFA means it profits to everybody. In these centers, you have to negotiate with the parents so that they will give you a, lo a, a location that you will renovate. You have to negotiate with the kids themselves, boys and girls, so that they will come to the center, get a basic education. On top of it, they will have some skills training. Women, you know the tie-dye. This is what we call tie-dye. They come and learn how to do it. You have also menuisserie. I don't know how to say it in, in, in English anyway. It's carpentry. So they learn carpentry and other, thing, other skills. And when, if they want to go back to the... There is links between the formal and the non-formal education. So that if from these centers they want to go back to the formal education, they have that possibility. So this is a way of bringing back drop out to the formal education. Thank you very much. Um, just one remark to say that you, you have, um, you have um, said that we don't have to oppose uh, the responsibility of the state and the responsibility of the community and the family. It's, I think it's an important idea. We have to work together. You see, the responsibility of a minister is to know how to negotiate. You know, the first thing to do is to negotiate with your own staff. <laughs> then the teacher unions. Then the communities. You know how teacher unions are strong. I don't know if they are strong here, but in my country, they are very strong. So whenever there is a problem, I did something special in Guinea. I um, redeployed 1,806 teachers from secondary to primary. 
from uh, cent from cities to 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 the villages. How did I do it? I brought in the teacher unions. I invited them to a meeting and said, "You have two. I have two solutions. I have more than one." thousand and eight hundred teachers who are getting their salaries without working. How are we going to solve the problem? I have two solutions. It's either to fire them or to send them to where the work is, give them some incentives for you know, you know, the distance they will. They said to me, we'd rather see them continue working where the work is. This is how we did it. You saw you negotiate day and night you have to negotiate. Thank you very much. If we have time, I, I will, uh, uh, it would be a pleasure to, to give you some European and French uh, focus and examples about uh, the same kind of things. I think uh, we have a lot of, a lot of sh things to share between continents about uh, those measures. But first, uh, I, I would like Mercedes, Mercedes <laughs> pardon, uh, to um, explain us uh, more deeply uh, how, uh, how works uh, the program uh, called, um, uh, called um, Yo Si Puedo. Um, maybe in Cuba, but um, uh, also in other countries, to understand uh, your solutions for uh, making, coming back the, making come back the, the, um, the pupils. First of all, it's important two or three steps in, term, in terms of uh, uh, preventing drop-off and uh, take the student back. Literacy for adult people, but opportunity for continuing the studies. Because in the way that they increase their study, they understand better that it's a need. But at the same time, it should be together with teacher training in order that they can deal with this situation that they have. Together with this, we understand that in the school system, and we apply in our program, a diagnosis process. The diagnosis process that consists on to know about the students, the community, and the situation that they have, and their culture, because it's important. We live in a multicultural uh, world, <laughs> because there is not only one culture in a country. And if we don't know the tradition, their feelings, how they feel about the culture, we cannot help them in the learning process. That's why in our programs we take into account the cultural aspect, mainly in the case of the linguistic situation. That is one of the problems in some cases because of the multilingual countries that have the multicultural countries, they have difficulties in understanding and that is a reason to drop up the school. Even the diagnosis process, we did all the elements we have to negotiate which is the better language that we are going to use in the literacy program. That's why we have different versions of the Josie Puedo program, not only in Spanish, nine in Spanish, because although a group of countries speak Spanish, they are different from one country to another, and which has English version different from one country to another, in New Zealand, in Canada, and uh, Nigeria, Namibia, but they are different, okay? We have to take into account the peculiarities in the point of the linguistic phenomenon. And in the case of the native languages, because I'm sure that most of the drop up belongs to the poor people and indigenous people, because that is a reality that we live in those countries. And most of the cases is that they know their native language. But when you change to the official language, they have difficulties in understanding. And if they do not understand what's happening at school, they drop out. That's why we have to take into consideration the linguistic situation 
and for us is very important. The elements that we detected in this diagnosis pro process should be taken into account in the program that we apply. And it happened that in some cases, the program or the program have not, uh, nothing to do with the people that is receiving the program. And they go out because they do not understand. Understanding is a, the main problem that in some cases they have. In some communities, not always as the financial problem because they want to go to school. But if they do not understand what happened in the school, they go out. That's uh, one of the things. The syllabus or curriculum is very important. In our program, we have a link of the cultural aspect of the country together with the academic point. That's why the diagnosis could not be only from the academic point of view. We have to know which are the difficulties that the student have. We have to know which is the problem that we have to solve in that sense. But at the same time, we have to know how they are, how do they feel, how do they live in order to know. Another point that is important is the interaction. Our program is an individual program, but we have a, an element that we call facilitator. That is the one that is together with the students. And the interaction between the facilitator and the participant that we call, or in the case of a school, the interaction between the, the teacher and the student help to know which are the real problems that they have in order that help them to solve this. If the teacher don't have the real communication with the student, they don't know what happened. They don't know what they think and they cannot help them. And in some cases, the problem is not academic problem. They drop out because they have all the problems they cannot solve and they need help in this term. Thank you very much. I think that you, this suggests a lot of things, a lot of questions. Maybe we can begin with the second part of our uh, meeting uh, with the questions of uh, the floor and also with questions coming from Twitter and, and my wise. So I have to, to see this, those questions. But if you have some questions in the room, um, there is one person and another one. Thank you. Good evening. I've been impressed uh, by the different uh, outcomes and uh, standpoints of the three uh, aspects that you have uh, remarked. Actually, the results apparently are on your side. You have been uh, fighting back positively the dropouts effects. But uh, I would like to ask you something. Uh, it's beautiful, it's a positive, and you gave me some good tip. I would like to turn the problem upside down. Is there anything in your judgment that could eventually be revised? I don't know, a mistake you made, or something that you couldn't deal with, or let's put it better this way, let's say, is there a reason for which it's difficult, for example, Madame Acker, to recover that 11%. Which is the reason for which you could recover more than 40% and not that 11? Um, I'm curious about, and I would like an answer from all three of you. Excuse me for my... Ah, by the way, my name is Manrico. I come from Italy, from Florence, and I'm of the Barbiana School. Good Thank evening. you very much. Thank you very much. So who wants to answer? But. We need to study that more, but there are some students that struggle and 
we have worked to give them extra help, okay? But when you're working in really low-income communities, there's a, a transience problem. You occasionally lose a child because the family moves. Um, but yes, I, we aim for 100%, but I seem to continue to get the normal distribution where I have uh, five, ten percent that walk on water, you know, that get 100 percent, 90 percent, and then the other end of the normal distribution. Um, okay, but I am quite satisfied with where we're going because we were losing 56 percent and they, uh, they're doing well. And we did have a study by the Boston Consulting Group because many people told us our program costs too much money. Well, this is silly because it costs far more for them not to complete. And f the Boston Consulting Group, like McKinsey, uh, said every dollar donated generates back $24 to society. The net present value of the graduate is 50,000. So I was quite thrilled at this. And uh, perhaps we could do more, but I wasn't able to raise money or to build on any extra component to chase that tail, you know? Uh, but we should always aim for 100%. We should aim for 100%, but we often end up with the normal distribution. Yes. You see, it's a process. You never finish. <laughs> so that's where data collection, disaggregated, is very important. And this is, what, this is the problem in Africa, how to get the data mm. in a regular basis. One. How to do, continue doing research action to see where the gaps are so that you can plan better the next year. So... It's a process. I think this, this question of the, the art core is very, very important. It's a terrible question because most of the countries have this problem with at least 10% of, uh, of, the, of the children. So to, we have to address very seriously your, this, this question. And there is, no, there is no, not one answer, of course. But I would like to add that uh, first, those 10 or 15%, we see them at the first age, at the age of four or five, we know that 15 or 20 percent of the children are predictably uh, possible future uh, persons concerned by dropout. So uh, actions have to be concentrated on this age uh, if we want to have an effect on those 10 persons. Uh, I, I think it can be discussed, of course, but I think that's this point for those 10%, when you have more than 15%, uh, it's, it's because you have special po conditions of poverty, like the, the condition that Karin has described, and so we can have uh, uh, action about that, but it's very difficult to go below to 10% because something has not been done before, that even if we, we have to still... Uh, if I could just say one more thing, perhaps, if we stopped, like we've been doing this since 1960. 19, since 1960, we've known, or even before, I spoke about one of the researchers the other day who was on a panel, that socioeconomic status is the biggest predictor, okay? But what we do, because the government's levers are in the schools, the government's levers are not in the community, the government continues to spend money revising the curriculum, reforming the school, and criticizing the teachers. I'm going to tell you something. It doesn't matter what you do to the school. They can't solve that problem because school ends at 3.30, 4 o'clock. We come in then. It's the community together. We used a systems approach. And again, I want to say our program was not designed to change the teachers, change the parents, change the institution. The role of the student parent support worker is to help the student understand and have a good relationship, negotiation, you hear that again? All right, there's a problem with the teacher, together the student parent support worker is the advocate and they go and solve the problem. 
So you have good relationships with the student and the teacher, good relationships with the student and the parent. Maybe we can't do everything, but by working on the interstices, the spaces between, and the relationship between the, the high school and post-secondary. You know, in Canada, to apply to university costs you over $150 and you need a credit card. Now, where is a poor family going to get the money to do that? That's when we start to use this money that I told you we raised. We don't think about this. We take this for granted. This is where we have to look at our invisible bag of privileges. Right? Thank you very much. We have 15 minutes left, so, so we have to have brief questions and brief answers in, the, in those uh, 15 minutes, beginning with you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Farouk Burney. I'm from uh, Al Fakhura, an organization in Qatar. I just want to uh, congratulate uh, Carolyn on, on her program. Uh, I happened to uh, work for that program when I was in Canada, and uh, I was 10 years ago. And what was remarkable to see now is that program started with one community and it expanded into 11 communities across Canada. Uh, my question is that within region community where the program was, there were diverse families from so many different backgrounds. We had Somali communities, we had communities from, from Bangladesh, from India, and native communities, Jamaican communities. How were we able to work with such diverse communities, especially with their families, where they were first generation Canadians? So what were the kind of challenges that, that, that were faced by the program? All of the families wanted the same thing. All of the families wanted their kids to graduate high school and go to post-secondary. So you find the common goal and you work together. But we had done other things to help the community. When you have community garden and you have a Somali farmer uh, gardener here and a Vietnamese gardener here, and I mean, we celebrated the diversity. So we did not have this problem. And the other thing I want to say is they want to be Canadians. So we take the Muslim girls and everybody else to skate. They want to put ice skates on. They want, and we explain to the parents. So they come with their hijab and they skate. They have fun. It, you know, it's just built a strong community, and they love the diversity themselves, the children. They learn from each other. So for me, it's a major strength, not a weakness. I never had any problem with that. Never. There is two other questions there, and then. My name is Sheila Sisulu uh, from the World Food Program. Um, the causes of, of uh, dropouts. I think, I think uh, the chairman of, uh, of uh, Fawe has talked about uh, early marriages uh, and, and so forth, and then also the socioeconomic background of, of, of children who drop out. In the, socio in the, in the economic sphere, um, do, do you find that in Africa in particular and in other places that um, the lack of food in the household contributes to dropping out, uh, particularly of the girls, and also contributes to early marriage, by the way. Um, and and to, to specifically to, to the chair of FAWE, has the statistic improved in Africa in the last 10 years, where the dropout rate was largely between grade one and grade two, and it was 50%. Has it changed, and if so, how? I had a question of uh, Twitter, which is in the same uh, direction, okay. uh, which is, what are the most effective strategies for stopping girls from dropping out of secondary school? And understanding that stipends and scholarships often only help with fees, and not the larger hidden cost of secondary education. I didn't quite get it, but the lack of food, I said it. I said, you know, if, if the child is hungry, he cannot concentrate. So if, if WFP, in fact, used to help in the countries, give that one meal a day. You even have some children that come for that, food, that meal, and then they learn anyway. They come and they learn. So it's a, it's a way of bringing them to school. And as far as uh, hunger is concerned at the household level, it's, it's true. 
That's why I said it's important for, to, to bring in, for the far away, would like in, in countries, we work with other NGOs, giving some grants to the, the, the mothers so that they are able to grow crops or do something else to earn some money so that they will be able not only to feed the family, but also to, to, to pay some, some uh, you know, the fees, school fees and uh, uh, stipends, whatever, for the kids to, to continue their studying. It's very important. And uh, you said for secondary? Yes, it was um, about the hidden costs of secondary education. Adolescent pregnancy and early marriage and also this lack of money. You know, to go to secondary education, uh, school, it's very expensive. That's where FAO is putting the bursaries, in fact, most of the bursaries. It's some kids that have uh, finished uh, even lower secondary, cannot go to upper secondary because of lack of money of the par from the parents. And when we come in with the bursaries, it makes a difference. It helps a lot. What is your perception in this um, field about uh, boarding schools? The importance of boarding schools as a solution to give material conditions to girls and boys uh, who have dropped out or who are uh, in possibility of dropping out. Countries will tell you that it's very expensive. Farway has tried to have some what we call uh, see uh, centers of excellence where you have some boarding, school, uh, boarding spaces for girls that have been rescued from early marriage. In Kenya, you have Kajado. The girls, we, we rescue the girls because the, uh, the parents, um, not the parents, but the religious uh, community has accepted to work with Fawe. So the girls have been rescued and they are in a dormitory and they live there now until they, they grow up. Unless we, re, we, we negotiate with, with the parents so that the girls can go back and not be given to the old man, you know, not marriage. So we rescue them. So, but when we try to, to replicate it in else countries, they said that it's, it's, it is expensive. And the role is, of FAO is to give a best practice at, country, at, you know, at local level, and, that, and the government should take it up and go to scale. But they are telling us that it is expensive. The World Bank, in fact, a colleague of mine, because I was in UNESCO, he told me, look, Aisha, you are exaggerating in FAO. How can you go back to, uh, what did you say? What is um, Boarding school. Boarding school. How can you come back to boarding school? You know that it is expensive. Come on, stop it. And I said, you will not stop it. I think wherever it is needed, when you have very needy, I mean households that are very, very poor, please, let's have it. Yeah. So that the kids will have access to education. Is that right? It's very interesting. I just had the, in the case of France, we created some boarding schools called boarding schools for excellencies. And with, with this aim, it's, um, uh, but uh, we don't have time to develop this point, but I think it's a very important uh, point. There was a question. Um, it's okay, it's the same question? Upstairs. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tessir and I'm from Jordan. <coughs> I would like to thank uh, the panelists uh, uh, for the uh, kind of programs that they have outlined. My question is for all of them uh, is, don't you think that we need a different conceptualization for the whole concept of dropout? Because dropout, in fact, just account for only 40% of out-of-school children. So the, the concept what we are looking for, in fact, is out-of-school children. And there are four different categories under that. Only one of them is dropout. Uh, in, in most of countries, especially in the third world, and in the third world is you have never enrolled students, you have those enrolled but never attended, and you have those who 
are late in terms of enrollment. And then you have the dropout. And the dynamics and the causes for each one of these categories are totally different. And we have to design our programs and innovations based on a careful analysis of, for each one of these categories. For example, in this part of the world and in, in many other countries, although we don't have much uh, in terms of uh, dropout, uh, but some students, they enrolled late because of proximity of a school, because of distance, for example. Ch parents are afraid to, the, to send them because there are tr no transportation, for example. And other families, for example, they don't send their children to schools uh, simply because they don't have documents, they don't have self, uh, uh, birth certificates, and, and so forth. And, uh, uh, others, they enrolled but never attended because they are afraid. And then the concept of dropout, which is after attending school. So I think we have to reconceptualize and put, to put a new framework that would accommodate all these categories within a formal and non-formal approach that would work together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Two answers. I, I think I, I am the best to, to respond to your question. Why? My father started school. When he came to school, he, he went to the third class instead of starting early. My grandfather went to the sixth grade. You know why? And I have a colleague who went to school with me. He started at the 11th grade. We did the baccalaureate one and two together. Why? It's because they had already some education at home. So a lot of knowledge. So building up to what the kid is bringing. I do believe that we need that type of school, an education system which will accept formal and non-formal. You come in when you can, you go out when you want, come back again when you want. How to do it is our challenge today. That's why we are in WISE. Thank you. Can I just make one, one comment to you, sir? You're absolutely correct. My, my story is the dropout story. But what I learned this morning was that two-thirds of the children who are not in school are in war-torn countries. So the conflicts that are going on in the world are keeping two-thirds of the children out of school. This is what we need to worry about, these damn wars I had forgotten to tell him, I'm Muslim. <laughs> so these parents had already, know, we already know how to read and write before coming to school. <laughs> so the non-formal, they're coming to the formal. Mercedes Zamora. Uh, With your microphone. <laughs> um, we have to analyze according to the diagnosis of the situation, which is the learning strategy that we have to follow because all the cases are not the same, of course. But we have to have an alternative of adult education because we have to think that if the students drop, up, drop out and we don't have any alternative, we have the seats for the future illiterate people in the country. Thus, we have to pay attention to the dropout. Thank you very much. Another question. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I actually wanted to follow up on the last gentleman's question because I think it's, it's critical that we, we have a sense of what it is that we're talking about. But just to concentrate on the dropout issue, I was interested in the definition which we didn't get, whether it's time bound, you know, the dropout, are we talking about dropping out in year, in, in school year? Are we talking about not returning the following year so you get lost to the system? Are we talking about not completing any phase, whether it's primary education? So what exactly is it that we're talking about? Because I think it has an impact on the strategies. I also wanted to comment and say that, you know, government, I agree that the issue of dropout is not only a, an education issue. Um, but I think governments invest a lot of money in social programs, whether it's health, whether it's social development. And it's, it's important that governments start thinking 
horizontally, or oh, I don't know which one is, is across, where they leverage the investments that they make in each of the department or in each of the government departments in support of the child and i think and until governments do that understand that if education is a priority it means each and every government department that has social protection policies those policies have to speak to the way that education functions yes we there is a question of definition of dropout as you said and as you as you said and uh, that's why we began to, to say the conception of dropout that we have in all the countries. Uh, we have to, to, to see that uh, uh, the problem is quite different uh, uh, in the different countries. For example, we saw that in Africa, dropout can be a problem for children with the age of five or six or seven in the first year of school. Whereas in northern countries, in general, dropout is about uh, children or young people of 15, 16 years old. So uh, that don't uh, um, prohibit to think globally the problem of dropout because the problem of dropout is a kind of revelator of the problem of school. Uh, that's why we have to see the question of prevention of dropout and that the, what we said first, um, prevention of dropout is is seeing the material problems, as we saw, with responsabilization, the psychological problems. Um, uh, Carol, Caroline spoke about the culture of failure uh, in some way. So we have to address this problem to prevent dropout. And the what we can call the intellectual uh, questions, which is the question of curriculum, the adaptation of curriculum to cultures, as said Mercedes. Uh, th those three categories of problems are uh, to problems to be addressed uh, to prevent dropout for very young persons, for uh, older persons, and for girls and boys. And we see also that girl is more a problem for uh, for southern countries, whereas in northern countries we have a bigger problem with boys. Uh, so it's different, but it uh, allows us. To, have, to try to have a common concept. This is to prevent dropout, but you are, we have to find a solution to uh, when there is dropout, and we try to speak about that also. And I think that we see that there is no, not one solution because there is not one problem, but a, a series of solutions, uh, um, uh, numerous solutions. And, we, and I think that what we can get today is uh, some ideas um, of uh, this spectrum of, of solutions. Uh, we have five minutes, I think, uh, and there, there, are, there was an, another question. Yes, I am from Mauritius, and uh, I, I was going uh, to uh, add on the definition of, uh, of dropout, which, according to me, um, besides all the other problems like socio-economic, poverty, et cetera, et cetera, uh, those who do not make up the grade at the level after five or six years of primary schooling are also dropouts. And uh, maybe those, um, they did not have a good start, that's why uh, they had to follow the others who were rushing uh, to complete the six years of primary schooling. I'm talking uh, about my country where we have a primary schooling for six years. So they have to rush because there is an exam after six years and the teachers concentrate on those who can rush and leave behind the others. And we have a program which we have started now which is the Bridging the Gap program. And uh, that is uh, at the level of the first year only, we ensure that all those who enter the primary schools uh, have the competencies required. Maybe all of them didn't go to the same level of a pre-primary school. Okay, this is one. And uh, I feel that um, uh, in order to um, to reduce the dropout rates in this part, 
in, in our part of the world because I also consider myself to be a part of Africa. A government should, and should see that uh, education is made free for the primary and the secondary. In Mauritius, it is primary, secondary, and tertiary. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. It's very important. Early child, early child good care and education. But we were focusing ourselves on primary and secondary. But start early is the best way. Because then, and also the language of instruction, building on the potential of a child when, when, when he or she comes, while we use the foreign language. So when, when the child arrives, you are not building on what he knows. You are, he has a, or she has a shock because you are talking to him or her in a language which, yeah, you just don't understand. That's one. Second, these exams, I think we have to lobby and just stop the exams. They are failing our kids. It's true. They are failing them. Six years, you have this exam, and you know, the level is so high, then you fail 60%, 70%, and if they fail twice, they are out. So we really should get rid of it. Yeah. <laughs> and also, <laughs> you know, lower level, you should get rid of it. I, I say it every time I meet a minister, and they say, it's because you are not a minister anymore. I say, because I believe that we should get rid of it. <laughs> and also, there was one thing we didn't talk about. It's the conflict, the kids coming from a conflict country where the parents have to, to migrate with the children they have to drop out. In Guinea, we, we shared our schools. When the librarians and the Sierra Leans came to Guinea, because our kids were not going to school on Thursdays, Saturdays, and Sundays, the, the kids, the foreign kids, I mean foreign, they are our kids because they are librarians and Sierra Leans, we, they were using our schools. Since they were speaking English while we speak French, we requested the students that ran with them to come and you know, give them, and it was amazing. Because the children told me that education means a future for them. And they're very happy. Thank you very much. It can be the, the conclusion. Uh, uh, you want to add two words or it's okay? Mercedes, you want to add something? Jose Martí, <laughs> be culture is the only way to be free. <laughs> okay, I think it's a very good conclusion, of course. Uh, I, uh, yes, you can applaud. <laughs> uh, I have to add some uh, practical um, information you must have. Um, first, there is a gala dinner in the conference hall from 7.30 to 21.30. Uh, the shuttle buses are available in your hotel and the doors open at 6.30 and close at 7.15. Um, you have to return your translation headsets when leaving the room. And also, uh, you have to know that tomorrow at uh, 9.45 a.m., uh, following the plenary session panel discussion, uh, we will have Gordon Brown, former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, making a case for the importance of education and uh, highlighting some of the obstacles to reaching the MDJ on universal basic education by 2015. So tomorrow you have a conference of Gordon Brown. That's the resume. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>